Okay, so welcome to this Sunday discussion, not Sunday share. <laughs> uh, the title is Midrashic Betrayal. Oops, sorry. The title is Midrashic Betrayal, and the subtitle is How the Lack of Clarity Surrounding Pshat and Drash Has Given Rise to Confusion, Disillusionment, and Conflict in Jewish High School Students. So I'm calling this a, uh, well, we'll talk about why I'm calling this a discussion in a second. So three objectives, okay. Uh, first objective is to, uh, I, I'm going to say diagnose, we'll use the medical analogy here, diagnose a problem in Jewish day school education, one of the many, uh, which I call midrashic betrayal syndrome. Second is to explain how I attempted to solve or alleviate the problem uh, during the 10 years that I taught at Shalhavit. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm not quite a veteran ed uh, educator, but I feel like 10 years was a good good trial run for these uh, this me the methods that I'm about to share. Three is to walk you through a selection of sources from Gaonim, Rishonim, and Achronim, on, uh, which I base my approach on. And uh, it's going to be a, a, a lot of sources here. And then I think I've shown you this, This uh, I mean, I know I've shown this to you before, I forgot when, earlier in the year, the uh, the Sunday, Sunday sheer spectrum from uh, Chiddush on the one side to basic idea on the other side with my wheel of anxiety, uh, circle of anxiety. Uh, and once again, today's sheer I fear is gonna be way, way, way too basic. And you're gonna think like, oh, this is obvious. You know, why do I waste my time? Why is he even giving Sunday sheer? So what I'm hoping is like this is I guess, well, let's put it this way. Worst case scenario every, is that you already know all the ideas that I'm going to share and all the sources. Better case scenario is you know all the ideas, but you see some new sources that like you haven't seen before and that triggers new insight. But what I'm really hoping for is a, a discussion. Uh, I don't want this to be, I mean, obviously the questions are always welcome in all of my shirim, but I, I'm hoping that this is a much more back and forth than normal because basically I'm going to walk you through a few basic points but I would like to explore this problem uh, together because we do have different perspectives. I mean, I've taught at Shalhavit for 10 years, but like, you know, there are those of you who have taught or, you know, younger kids or, or who are parents and, and have younger kids might have a different insight or, or other teachers who have tried out other methods. And I kind of want, my goal is for us to discuss this and then emerge with greater clarity on both of our parts. So that's the, the scope of today's year. A few additional notes. Um, this is not a sheer on the methodology of learning Midrash. We are going to talk a little bit about methodology, uh, but if you want Midrash methodology sheer, and then uh, I, I have given those on my weekly Humish methodology sheer, and I could direct you to those if you are interested in further methodology. Uh, also, I'm going to be keeping examples to a minimum, uh, and uh, my fear was that the scope of the sheer would be too big if we went into examples. So if you feel like you needed an example of a particular point, go ahead and ask, and I'll, I'm sure I'll be able to come up with one. But we're going to, I think, only use two examples in this entire sheer of actual Midrashim. And then the third thing, which is also unusual, is uh, I usually provide the Hebrew and the English in the sources. This time it's all in English because uh, a lot of this was drawn from articles I've written or from uh, high school presentations that I've given. Uh, and I didn't have all the sources on hand. And also a lot of the sources are long. So if you want a particular source, you can ask me for the sources later. Okay, without further ado, um, we're going to start with, uh, like I did another uh, Sunday year, Richard Feynman. Okay, this is an excerpt from uh, his lesser known book, uh, What Do You Care What Other People Think? Further Adventures of a Curious Character. And he's going to tell an anecdote about his uh, his um, his Jewish upbringing, and it's kind of a long anecdote, but I, I felt it was important to hear it in his words because it's a very vivid depiction of the problem that the Shir is going to focus on. So he says, I had been brought up in the Jewish religion. My family went to the temple every Friday. Uh, I was sent to what he, we called Sunday school, and I even studied Hebrew for a while. But at the same time, my father was telling me about the world. When I would hear the rabbi tell about some miracle, such as a bush whose leaves were shaking, but there wasn't any wind, I would try to fit the miracle into the real world and explain it in terms of natural phenomena. Some miracles were harder than others to understand. The one about the leaves was easy. When I was walking to school, I heard a little noise. Although the wind was hardly noticeable, the leaves of a bush were wiggling a little bit because they were in just the right position to make a kind of resonance. And I thought, aha, this is a good explanation of, for Elijah's vision of the quaking bush. But there were some miracles I never did figure out. For instance, there was a story in which Moshe throws down his staff and it turns into a snake. I couldn't figure out what the witnesses saw that made them think his staff was a snake. As an aside, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that he, I mean, it's, it's, it's not surprising, but it is interesting that he took the approach that is taken by several of, of you know, the Mepharshim, such as the Royal Bog, Abravanel sometimes, where, you know, where miracles are done through uh, harnessing a natural property and, and the, you know, the 
less overt the violation of nature, uh, the better. And some research don't even take it to the point where uh, it is much more like what Feynman's saying, but that's not our focus. If I had thought back to when I was a much younger age, the Santa Claus story could have provided a clue for me, but it didn't hit me hard enough at the time to produce the possibility that I should doubt the truth of the stories that don't fit with nature. When I found out that Santa Claus wasn't real, I wasn't upset. Rather, I was relieved that there was a much simpler phenomenon to explain how so many children all over the world got presents on the same night. The story had been getting pretty complicated. It was getting out of hand. Santa Claus was a particular custom we celebrated in our family, and it wasn't very serious. But the miracles I was hearing about were connected with real things. There was the temple where people would go every week. There was the Sunday school where rabbis taught children about miracles. It was much more of a dramatic thing. Santa Claus didn't involve big institutions like the temple, which I knew were real. So all the time I was going to the Sunday school, I was believing everything and having trouble putting it together. But of course, ultimately it had to come to a crisis sooner or later. The actual crisis came when I was 11 or 12. The rabbi was telling us a story about the Spanish Inquisition in which the Jews suffered terrible tortures. He told us about a particular individual whose name was Ruth, exactly what she was supposed to have done, what the arguments were, were in her favor and against her, the whole thing as if it had been documented by a court reporter. And I was just an innocent kid listening to all this stuff and believing it was a true commentary because the rabbi had never indicated otherwise. At the end, the rabbi described how Ruth was dying in prison and she thought while she was dying, blah, blah, blah. That was a shock to me. After the lesson was over, I went up to him and said, how did they know what she thought when she was dying? He says, well, of course, in order to explain more vividly how the Jews suffered, we made up the story of Ruth. It wasn't a real individual. That was too much for me. I felt terribly deceived. I wanted the straight story, not fixed up by someone else, so that I could decide for myself what it meant. But it was difficult for me to argue with adults. All I could do was get tears in my eyes. I started to cry. I was so upset. He said, what's the matter? I tried to explain. I've been listening to all these stories. This is a critical point now. I've been listening to all these stories and now I don't know of all the things you told me, which were true and which were not true. I don't know what to do with everything I've learned. I was trying to explain that I was losing everything at the moment because I was no longer sure of the data, so to speak. Here I've been struggling to understand all these miracles and now, well, it solved a lot of miracles all right, but I was unhappy. The rabbi said, if it's so traumatic for you, why do you come to Sunday school? Uh, my, because my parents make me. I never talked to my parents about it, and I never found out whether the rabbi communicated with them or not, but my parents never made me go again, uh, and it was just before I was supposed to get confirmed as a believer. Anyway, that crisis resolved my difficulty rather rapidly in favor of the theory that all the miracles were stories made up to help people understand things more vividly, even if they conflicted with natural phenomena. But I thought nature itself was so interesting that I didn't want it distorted like that, and so I gradually came to disbelieve the whole religion, and that is what Feynman identifies as the turning point, you know, or the, uh, the initial turning point. So uh, this is what I am calling uh, Midrashic Betrayal Syndrome, uh, is I, I, uh, if I had to define it, the detrimental effects of being raised and educated without a clear distinction between shot and drush, which again is not exactly the terms that Feynman used, but I think that's what corresponds here. Um, so I've over the years collected uh, a list of the, I guess the, the, uh, the stories or the, the, the interpretations that, the, that students on the whole tend to think are actually stated in the Tanakh, but are actually from Midrashim, okay? So just to give you an example of what we're talking about here. Um, oh, sorry, hold on just one second here. Oh, uh, just go on, I think I just, yeah. Okay, so for example, um, that Yamsu parted when Nakshon walked into the water until it was up to his nose. Uh, Avram Avin was thrown into a fiery furnace and was miraculously saved. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was 18 feet tall, or 20, you know, whatever, uh, 10 almost. Rivka was three years old when she married Yitzchak. Hashem literally looked into the Torah to create the world. The arm of Bas power miraculously stretched to reach baby Moshe. Uh, the mock of Tzfardea uh, involved a large frog splitting into many smaller frogs. Aesop tried to bite Yaakov's neck, but Yaakov's neck turned into marble. Uh, Moshe killed the Mitzri, taskmaster by saying Hashem's name. The man tasted like whatever he wanted, and, and more. So, you know, when I go through these, then uh, there's always, you know, audible gasps when certain students realized that things that they thought were actually in the psukim weren't actually there. And sometimes I'll get a particular student who is very, very convinced that something is in the psukim. So I'll hand her a, a chumash and say, okay, you know, here's the parsha, show me where it says it. And they'll have to see with their own eyes that this was not actually stated there, you know? So what I've, oh, and, 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 and sometimes these can have, you know, drastic effects. For example, to me, the most shocking one was this last one I added on the list is that Bilaam was as great of a Navi as Moshe. You know, I was talking about Nebuus Moshe one day and saying how no one was 
you know, as great of a Navi as Moshe. And this one student like raised her hand and said, but Chazal say that Bilam was as great as Moshe. And indeed there is a Midrash that says that, but you know, to not differentiate between that Midrash and the actual Psukim at the end of uh, Sefer Devarim, you know, is, is an example of this uh, phenomenon that we're talking about here. So because of this, you know, this clash, you get these, uh, a variety of symptoms. And again, it's different in different students, depending on the ages and what their upbringing was. So sometimes there will be shock, disbelief, and denial about the actual facts of Torah, as I mentioned, meaning that they will just refuse to believe that, that, you know, that this is what the Torah actually teaches. Uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll decide in favor of the Midrashim that they've been uh, raised with. Um, many times there are feelings of anger, resentment, and disillusionment at their parents, at their teachers, uh, at Judaism as a whole for feeding them lies. And that's really what the Feynman story was intended to illustrate. And, you know, I'll have students who will just like say overtly, like, you mean we, we were raised to believe in lies and no amount of me explaining what Midrashim actually are or, or how you're supposed to approach Midrashim. You know, I can give all these explanations, but the feeling of I was lied to is 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 what overshadows everything you know the idea that that um or, or like Feynman said the fact that i was not taught that there is a difference between shot and drush you know and and now i just don't know what to believe uh similarly uh there is oftentimes a paralysis a methodological confusion or frustration about how to go about their own learning like what do i do now like what do i trust how do i approach these midrash how do i approach the shot what am i supposed to do um uh sometimes it will lead to uh, unwarranted mistrust or rejection of other aspects of Judaism, meaning that because of these feelings of, of betrayal in regards to, like, say, uh, Chumash, they will lack trust in Halakha or in Torah Walpeh, and it'll uh, express itself that way. And then worst case scenario is that this adds to the rationalization for going off the derech. Um, you know, Feynman, I don't, I don't really know, obviously, what he was like as a kid, but, you know, you can have a case maybe where this actually causes an intellectual change that causes you to go off the derech, but in most cases, it's just going to contribute to whatever other reasons they're already rationalizing going off the derech. So this is a big problem, and, uh, you know, I'm sure if we ask other Jewish educators what the biggest problems are in Jewish education, I don't know if they would say this. I just encountered this again and again and again, and I think it's at the root of a lot of the difficulties, and that's why I want to address it today. So first thing we need to do uh, is define shot and drush. And uh, I'm sure there are many valid theories. Um, I'm going to share with you my theory, but we're going to start off with some incorrect definitions. So whenever I ask my students, what's the definition of shot? There are always two answers that they give uh, that uh, I think are incorrect. The first one is the simple meaning of the Pasuk. And the reason why I think that this is incorrect is that sometimes shot is not simple. In fact, in many cases, it's not simple. Either it is complex, uh, it's multifaceted, it's deep. For example, Shema Yisrael Hashem Kim Hashem Echad, okay? Understanding what we mean by Hashem Echad is not a simple idea. Um, you know, you can read it simplistically, but the, the simplistic reading is not the same thing as the Pshat. Uh, similarly, when people say Pshat is the literal meaning of the Pasuk, that's also not true. Uh, sometimes the Pshat is not the literal meaning. I mean, you know, eye for an eye, uh, the Pshat is not that you poke someone's eye out. Or when it says Hashem Ish Ochlahu, Hashem is a consuming fire, the Pshat is not that God is literally fire, you know? Um, so it's not the literal meaning of the Pasuk. Um, and uh, similarly, when I ask them what drush is, there's always one answer that they give. And it's, I, I, I've only heard this one answer. Drush is the deeper meaning of the Pasuk. Okay, uh, that's what they say. And the reason why that is inaccurate is that sometimes it's a deeper meaning of the Pasuk, but in many cases, drush has absolutely nothing to do with the meaning of the Pasuk, which is what I intend to show right now. Okay, so these are incorrect definitions. So I first have to like call out what incorrect definitions are to distance us from that. And then we go into, into what, what I think the correct definitions are. Now, th th these, this definition that I'm about to propose comes from many Mepharshim that I've learned. Uh, but if I had to pin it on one, it would be the Ibn Ezra. And he doesn't even use the terms Pshat and Drash. So I'm going to show you two sources from the Ibn Ezra and then back it up with uh, some other Rishonim here. So, um, I mean, actually, maybe I should ask. I mean, anyone want to try, if we're making this a discussion, uh, anyone want to take a stab at defining what Pshat is? I really should have asked that before I, uh, I gave the, the incorrect definitions. Sorry, did you say a, a shot or a drush? A uh, shot, yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard, I've heard you say- Oh, so you know, then do, yeah, if you've heard yeah. me from my shirim, then you know, you know what I'm saying, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll say it, but yeah. By the way, can you guys hear this electric guitar now? Okay, good. 
my neighbor downstairs got an electric guitar and I always worry what happens if I'm doing a Sunday shear and he's blaring the electric guitar. So I guess the Zoom is filtering it out. All right, Shlewis, okay. how about this? Yeah. The, intended, the intended message that a Pusik is meant to convey. Bingo. Okay, <laughs> couldn't have said it better myself, Ravi. All right, so let's let's see that in, inside here. Okay, so Ibn Ezra in his Hakdama to the Assyrians of Dibros, uh, in a much larger context, says a great analogy. I'm just going to take it for this one point here. So he says, as a general rule, the masters of the holy language will sometimes explain their words very clearly, and other times they will say what is necessary in a few concise words from which the listener can derive their meaning. Now here's his analogy. Know that words are like bodies and meanings are like souls, and the body to the soul is like a vessel. Therefore, the general rule of all wise men in any language or any nation is to preserve the meanings without regarding regard to a change of words, so long as the meanings remain the same. So to visualize this, again, this is for high schoolers, so I want to impress this on them with a, a visual muscle here. So you've got the box, you've got the kli, the vessel, so those are the words, and the purpose of the box is, is to convey the meaning, uh, is to convey the contents, so that's the meaning. And it's the meaning intended by the author, author with a capital A, if you're referring to um, much write something authored by Hashem, author with a lowercase a, if you're talking about Mishle, you know, Shlomo HaMelech, um, it's the intended meaning from the author. So that, that's my definition. Shot is the meaning of the words as intended by the author. And drush is utilizing the words as a platform for an extrinsic idea. And by extrinsic, I mean coming from without, okay? Uh, in addition to, or in contrast to, or in spite of the meaning intended by the author. We'll elaborate on this in a second. We're going to classify drushos in a little while. Okay, so shot is the words intended by the author, and drush is using the words to express an extrinsic idea. If you want to boil it down to like a cutesy litmus test, is if you, let's say you have an, uh, an explanation of a pasuk, and you want to know whether it's shot or drush. So you can ask yourself, is this explanation, is this idea in the words or is it on the words? Meaning, meaning, is this the thing that is embedded that was intended to be conveyed through the words that chosen by the author? Or are you just taking those words and then you're layering your own meaning on top of it, uh, regardless of what the author actually intended? So, yes. yeah, go ahead. Is it possible that the uh, author has um, the intent of developing other ideas more than just the plain meaning? Yes, uh, in fact, I think the Rambam is gonna be the one who says that in a little while. Okay, yeah. so your, your definition is, so your shot is, so if you're saying so intended by the author isn't really the key point, if, if that's the case, no? Well, are you saying, uh, let me just make sure I understand your question. Are you saying when the author intends multiple meanings, or are you saying when the author intends for you to be able to take his words and derive your own meanings from them? Well, both, either, either of those. Both, yeah. So if, if the author intends to uh, incorporate many meanings in there. So then, then you could have multiple pshatim. Let's say like in Chumash, you have, you know, a pasuk that it has a, a meaning within Torah Shavichsav, and then there's a halachic interpretation as well. And both of those are intended by the author. So then that's, you know, that I'd feel comfortable calling both of those pshat. Um, or let's say, for example, in Mishle, where Shlomo wrote, will write psukim with, um, with ambiguous or equivocal terms in order to incorporate multiple ideas into the Pasuk. So then I'd say that both of those are Pshat. Um, but if you're saying that the author wrote his words knowing that people are going to use them to come up with their own original interpretations that the author did not have in mind, but in other words, like the author intended that the words are are uh, are going to be able to be used as platforms for things, but people can come up with their own ideas. I'm not comfortable calling that shot. Okay, meaning that you know, let's take for instance, like um, you know, uh, the Haggadah. I mean, you know, like people use the Haggadah for all sorts of uh, of you know uh, their own like you know uh, it, it, you know ideas that they associate to it, like symbolism of the Arbacosos or or the you know the four sons or whatever. And like, it, uh, did the authors, authors of the Haggadah intend for that? Yeah, I think they did. I think the Haggadah was intended to be, you know, to facilitate discussion and chidushim and and your own additions. But I don't think that that's that everything that anyone says on it is automatically shot. And then the the the, the case that I think you can question maybe is what it, what about with Hashem? You know, Hashem obviously knows what everyone is going to interpret. You know, past, present, and future. Uh, and he knew that Rabbi Akiva would darshan the crowns. You know. But 
I, I still am, uh, you know, I, I think so, if something is truly a, uh, and, and he wrote the Torah in a way that lends itself to drush, but I'm not comfortable saying that something, an original idea that someone comes up with um, on their own that was not intended by the author is, uh, is shot. I think that's stretching it too far. So I don't know if that answers your question. So you'd give me those, you'd say is a uh, shot or a snap shot? So uh, this is a point that I debated where in this presentation to, uh, to address this. So I'm gonna address it later on. I'll say it now though, which is that um, there are two categories of drush that, we're, uh, that we could talk about. There's uh, Midrash Agada and Midrash Halacha, okay? This presentation is gonna focus almost exclusively on Midrash Agada. I'm gonna nod to Midrash Halacha uh, but one of the reasons I'm not going into that is I don't fully understand the sugya of Midrash Halakha and whether the drushos are uncovering halakhic ideas that were embedded into the Torah of Ikhsav or whether it was given over as a tool for creative interpretation that like, you know, that all, uh, vouchers were or whether it's just mnemonic devices. So uh, I'll, I'll address it briefly, but I'm, I'm focusing primarily on uh, Midrash Agada, which I'll define in a little while. Okay. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> What about cases like where some of the, like the Mepharshim on the Chumash, I think like, I feel like the Ramban does this a lot. Well, they'll, they'll provide sort of context or backstory for events that are overt in the Psukim and like not, not a drusha, not like sort of expounding on what's in the Psukim, but just sort of giving more of a backdrop for the events that are actually brought out in the Ksav. I don't have a particular yeah. example that's coming to mind, but is that the kind of thing that, you know, that from this framework you think of as Pshad or as Drash? A good question. Uh, let me answer that in uh, when I go into two categories of drush in a little while. Okay, if I forget, then remind me. When I let me see the next two things on this slide, <laughs> uh, that, I think that'll clarify it. Okay, so let me just first of all back up this definition just with a few more examples from Rishonim here. So the Rabag in his Hakdama to Shir Shirim uh, differentiates between the approach taken by Mepharshim before him and his approach. He says, we have seen that all the commentaries which our predecessors have made upon it and which have reached us adopt the Midrashic approach, including statements which are the opposite of what was intended by the author of Shir Shirim. These Midrashic statements, even though they are good in and of themselves, ought not to be applied as explanations of the things upon which they are said Midrashically. For this reason, one who wishes to explain these and similar things ought not to apply them to them the midrashic explanations regarding them. Rather, he should endeavor to explain them according to their intention. So I thought this was just a very clear statement of that distinction here is the author of Shir Shirim, Shlomo Melech, wrote it and he used words to convey his intent. So the Rabag is attempting to take a shot based approach of his commentary. We're going to try to figure out what Shlomo Hamelech meant. What was he intending to convey? Then there are midrashim which use the words, but do so in a way that either has nothing to do with the intent or might even be the opposite of the intent of the author. So again, clean distinction. Are you trying to get at the ideas conveyed by the author or are you using the words for some purpose that may or may not have been intended by the author? Another example, the Rashba in his Chidushe Agada uh, in Brachos uh, says, there are those who mistakenly think that Chazal are actually interpreting the psukim which are brought in their agada in accordance with their explanations therein. This is merely a style of agada, namely that the sages teach whatever it is they intend to teach and they bring psukim for their idea as if their intention is to interpret the puzzle in accordance with what they taught. But in truth, the puzzle only serves as an illusion and as a mnemonic device for their own idea. In truth, the sages had no intention to interpret these pasukim. Rather, their intention in this midrash and others like it is to remember the idea by remembering the pasuk as a mnemonic device. This shows wisdom on their part, for they take important and necessary ideas which have a tremendous value and firmly establish them in a language which will not be forgotten, namely the text of the pasukim. So again, we have to remember that there was a long period of time where the only text that we had was the Torah of Iksav, and everything else had to be remembered. And it's a very good mnemonic device to associate as many ideas as you can with the words of the psukim, um, because then you'll remember them. And you'll also imbue the puzzle with, uh, you know, with additional elements of, you know, uh, you know, associations, feelings, imaginations, but they all connect to these ideas. And so that's what he says, because all we're doing, they weren't interpreting the puzzle. And this, by the way, is why I, I, I kind of cringe every time someone uses the term drush and perush or interpretation um, when they use them synonymously, because there are midrashim that are interpretations, but there are midrashim that were never intended to be interpretations or explanations. They're 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 homilies. They're you know they're expounding, but they're not uh, interpreting. One more example, uh, and then we're gonna start classifying midrashim here. So the Rambam says 
this is in his explanation of the Tame Mitos for uh, the Mo'adim. So he says, as regards the Arba Minim, the four species, our sages gave specific reasons for them by way of drashos, the method of which is well known to those who are acquainted with the style of our sages. They use the text of the Torah only as a kind of poetical expression for their own ideas, not that these are the actual meaning of the text. So uh, I think common examples of this are, you know, the Arba Minim represent the four types of Jews. You know, like there are the Arba Minim that have the fragrant and the taste, and then the ones with the fragrance without the taste and all the permutations. And so too, there are Jews with, uh, you know, uh, with knowledge and with mitos, and then some with knowledge and no mitos. And then there's the other interpretation of the arbor, you know, the arbor minimum are the parts of the body, like Lulav is the spine, the Esrog is the heart, you know, etc. So I think he's talking about those. He says, with, oops, with regards to these drushos, people are divided into two groups. Some people think that the Midrash contains the real explanation of the text, whilst others mock it and ridicule it since it is clear and obvious that this is not the real meaning of the text. Um, so this is, if you're familiar with the Ramam's three groups in Perakhelek, this is group one. Group one thinks that Hazal are actually interpreting the text uh, and they take it literally. Uh, group two also takes it literally, but they mock it. They say, this is what Hazal thought that the Arba Minim represents, you know, or, or, or that what, the, what the Torah is teaching. That's ridiculous. Then the Rama says the former struggle and fight to prove and confirm such interpretations according to their opinion and to hold on to them as the real meaning of the text. They consider them in the same light as the received laws from the oral tradition. We're going to return to that point in a little while later. In other words, to them, there's no difference between halakha uh, lemoshim sinai or a halakhic, you know, uh, interpretation and uh, and like these types of uh, agadas. Neither of the two classes understood that our sages employ biblical text merely as poetical expressions, the meaning of which is clear to every reasonable reader. This style was widespread in ancient days. Uh, all adopted it in the same way as poets adopt a certain popular style. Okay, so. Um, so as I mentioned, so the, again, I, this is all just uh, uh, reinforcing this distinction here, okay? And uh, and there are many more sources than that, but those were the ones that expressed it the most clearly in my mind. Now, what I want to do is just briefly classify different types of drushos. And the way I see it, there are two categories, and then each one has a subdivision, okay? So the first category is what we call midrash agada, which the fancy English word is homiletic, which is non-legal concepts. And there are... Um, in my opinion, two categories of, uh, of, uh, of these drashos. And uh, the best expression of this is the Ibn Ezra, another hidden gem in Ibn Ezra, the Hagdama to, to Megillus Eifa. Okay, he says, however, the Torah's Midrashim follow many diverse paths. Some are riddles, secrets, and allegories, which are as lofty as the heavens. And some are to profit weary minds in deep chapters. And some are to provide faith for the stumbling and to fill the empty. Therefore, the meaning of Pesukim is like bodies, Okay, there's another analogy. And midrashim are like clothes clinging to the body. Some are like sheer silk, meaning like see-through silk, and others are like thick sackcloth. And the way of the shot is the body uh, in choice statements and in statutes. Likewise, Chazal said that the Pasuk is in accordance with its shot and the statements are ancient. So visual aid here, you've got the unclothed body, which is the shot, which is the meaning intended by the author. Okay, so that's what we're calling shot here. But then there's two categories of midrashim. Some uh, are like silk, which is see-through, which allow you to see the body. They are on top of the body, but they allow you to see the body. Um, and then some are like sackcloth, which is that they completely obscure and conceal the body. So I, in my mind, those are the two categories of the midrashim on Pesukim. Uh, there are pshat-oriented midrashim, which provide insight into the meaning of the Pesuk beyond the meaning conveyed by the author. And then there are non-pshat-oriented midrashim, which teach an idea that has absolutely nothing to do with the meaning of the Pesuk. And uh, this is really what Moshe was asking about. And I'm going to go into this in a second. I just want to show you two examples of this. Um, and again, this is not a Midrash methodology here in the sense of I'm not, we're not going to delve into any particular Midrash, but just two easy examples here. Okay, so let's take a Pasuk. Uh, first one's going to be an example of a shot oriented Midrash. So it says in Shemos, describing the birth of Moshe, Vatahar Ha'isha Vatelet Bain, Vatera Ozoki Tofu. So the woman, Yochavid, uh, conceived and gave birth to a son, and she saw that he was good. Okay, so what would you say shot is? Okay, forget Midrash for a second. What's Pshat if she saw that he was good? Either that he was healthy or that she liked him or something. Yeah, right. Some, some, some uh, you know, standard by which you measure goodness of babies, right? Healthy baby, well-behaved, he's beautiful, you know, uh, beloved, something like that. Okay, so that's Pshat. That is what the author uh, intended, Okay. But then you have this midrash, which is quoted by Rashi, uh, that says, "When Moshe was born, the entire house was filled uh, filled with light." Okay, so 
well, what's the meaning of the midrash? And again, I'm, we're not going into this in, in, in depth, but just, um, you know, clearly, okay, well, first of all, where, where does this midrash come from? Like, where does the author of the midrash get this from? That the house was filled with light? Is it, 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 it yeah, parallel to Kriya uh, Sa'olam, where it says, like, yes. the aura of some star exactly. is good? Right, so exactly. So the phrase, uh, this project says, Vatere Oso Kitofu, she saw that he was good. And that's an allusion to the first instance of this in Brejis, Vayar Elakim Esaor Kitov, God saw the light that it was good. Okay, so that's the, the Midrashic hook. Now, what did the Midrash mean? You can give whatever ideas you want. I mean, you could say that it had to do with the muscle of light being knowledge. You could, have to, you could say it has to do with the birth of Moshe, somehow was part of the culmination of the plan that was there in the outside of the world. That's for people who give cheer on this midrash. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's given cheer on this midrash in yeshiva, but you know, I'm sure you can find people to give a good shot, but something along these lines, okay? Now, I'm calling this a shot-oriented midrash because I'm assuming, and there's no way for me to know this for sure, I'm assuming that this midrash is intending to give us insight into the birth of Moshe, you know, or the role of Moshe, or something having to do with Moshe, okay? So that's an example, and that's an assumption on my part. Um, you know, you can say that if you hold that Rashi only gives that kind of midrash, then that's a good indication that you should learn the midrash this way. But, you know, there are certain midrashim that it's clear that they're trying to give insight into the psukim. Okay. Contrast that with another one. And this is an example quoted by many, many uh, of the Mepharshim. Ramam quotes this. Uh, the Rashba quotes this. So there's a Puskin Tavarim that says, tielcha al aze necha, vahaya you shall have a peg in addition to your weapon, a peg or a shovel in addition to your weapon. And it shall be that when you sit outside, you shall dig with it. You shall go back and cover your excrement. So the shot of the Pasuk, which is actually a uh, halakha, is that soldiers have to carry a, a peg or a shovel alongside their weapons. That's yased is a peg, al azenacha is on their weaponry. Uh, and they should use it to go, uh, and when they have to, you know, uh, to defecate, they should go dig a latrine outside of the camp. And then, uh, and then cover it because the Shekhinah walks in the camp. So that's the Pshat. That's the halakhic interpretation of what this is. Okay. Then you got this Midrash. Okay. The Midrash says, do not read al uh, uh, don't read azenecha, your weapon, but oznecha, your ear. This teaches us that if you hear a person saying something disgraceful, for example, Lashon Hara, put your fingers, your pegs into your ears. Okay. And uh, how do I know that this is not giving us insight into the shot. Well, uh, again, we don't know for sure because we, we don't have a, an answer book that explains the, the intended meaning of every Midrash. But the Rambam uses this as an example. He says, now I wonder whether these ignorant persons who take the Midrashic explanations as actual interpretations believe that the author of this saying gave it as the true interpretation of the text quoted and as the meaning of this mitzvah. That in truth, yased is used for finger and azenecha denotes your ear. I cannot think that any person whose intellect is sound can admit this. The author employed the text as a beautiful poetical phrase in teaching an excellent moral lesson, namely this. It is as bad to listen to Lashon Hara as it is to say it. That's what the Raman takes out of this. This lesson is poetically connected with the above text. In the same sense, you must understand the phrase, uh, do not read blank, but read blank whenever it occurs in the Midrash. So that's a common way that Midrashim do this is they say, you know, don't read the words with this vocalization, read it with this vocalization, and then they get an idea out of it. So again, don't think that Chazal are actually interpreting the Pesukim. They're just using the words in the public as a hook uh, to express an, uh, an unrelated idea. So what does this mean according to the Ramam? It means that it's as bad to listen to Lashon Hara as it is to say it. Maybe you can learn it as another idea of demonstrating the links that you should go to not listen to Lashon Hara, that you should plug your ears. Maybe it's teaching a practical lesson. Maybe it's giving you psychological insight into the base nature of Lashon Hara by associating excrement with, with undesirable speech. You know, again, if you want to share on that, then I'm sure someone in Yeshiva has given share on that. So, um, and then just to just to uh, uh, concretize this, also there's this long shilti giborim uh, that talks about midrashim, and and he also says the same distinction. He says there's another category of midrashim in which Chazal aimed to expound the pasuk in accordance with every idea that they were able to expound. In other words, they went out of their way to take the words and just attach as many meanings to the words as possible. They relied on that which is written. One thing God has spoken; these two have I heard. And on that which is written, behold, my word is like fire, etc. Um, they learn this from here that many meanings can emerge from one Pasuk. Do not be astounded by this, for we see in many cases that even an ordinary person speaks his words with a double meaning that can be interpreted in two ways, all the more so the words of the wise, which were stated with Ruach HaKodesh. In this manner, Chazal expounds scripture in every manner that is possible to expound, but they said no Pasuk can depart from its Pshat, which is the root. Of all these midrashim which are expounded, now here's Ibn Ezra's distinction, some 
of them are essential and close to the shot, whereas others contain only a small illusion. Now he's going to give an example in one second, but this actually relates to what Rabbi Fader was asking, which is what if you wrote the words in a way that lend themselves to many uh, to many ideas? You know, so it's the Shiloh Hiborim. I'm not sure which side of the fence to, or you know, which side to take on that. He's saying that Chachamim will write their words in a way where there can be multiple meanings. So that's like when I said Shlomo Melch writes his Mishle in, uh, in sometimes convoluted ways to teach multiple ideas. Anything with Ruach HaKodesh, you're going to be even better at doing this. But sounds like Chazal went beyond that and just used the Pasuk and just attached as many ideas to it as possible. You know, Now, did God intend for that? Yeah, you could say God intended for that, because if he didn't, then he wouldn't encourage us to do this. But does that mean that every idea that Chazal attached to the Pasuk is an idea that God wanted us to get out of the Pasuk? I think not. And I'm going to support that later on with a bunch of sources. But, um, but I just wanted to comment on, on, uh, on what Rabbi Fader said. So here's his example now. Uh, he says, you can see what was expounded by one of the sages in the first chapter of Tainus, where he said, Yaakov Avinu Lomes, Yaakov Avinu didn't die. One of the other sages responded, did the eulogists eulogize him in vain? Did the embalmers embalm him in vain? Did the grave diggers bury him in vain? So kind of a sassy answer of like, what's well, so you're saying? Like he didn't die and they just embalmed him while he was alive. That's ridiculous. The first sage answered back, Mikra ani Doresh. I'm just expounding on a verse. This means to say, I too know that he died, but my intention is to expound this verse in every manner that it is possible to expound. And if it is, uh, oops, typo there. And if it is impossible for the Midrash to be in accordance with the straightforward meaning, it nevertheless contains an allusion to another idea. For one can say he didn't die along the lines of that which was stated, Sadiqim, even in their death, are considered alive. Uh, for their reputation, their memory, and their deeds last forever. So, Again, I would I would take this as a midrash that I mean, look, we can debate whether God intended us to get this from the way that Yaakov Avinu's death is talked about, but the the Manda Amar here is saying I'm not actually interpreting the pasuk, I'm just expounding and giving this additional idea that we know that Sadi, the real essence of a tzaddik is their ideas and their way of life, and that continues to go on even when they die. Whereas Rishayim, they just live for their physical uh, you know possessions or their physical uh, stature or their honor, and that dies with them. So, um, so uh, that's a, another example of this. Um, one more example, and then, and then we'll go on with the categories uh, here, and then I'll, we'll pause for questions. So uh, this is kind of a side advertisement for, um, for uh, a method that I call radical shot. Okay, and this could be another shear, but among the Mepharshim, then there are, there's a spectrum of which Mepharshim rely strictly on the words and don't use any Midrash at all. So for example, you have, uh, the Mahari Kra, which we're going to read in a second, and you have the Rashbam, you have the Ibn Ezra, uh, Rabag in many cases, and then you have Mufarshim who are in the middle, like Rashi and Ramban, who will explain Pshat, but they'll draw upon statements of Chazal, and then you have the completely Midrashic, you know, uh, things like in, in Midrash Rabbah that have, you know, nothing to do with the Pshat. So the Mahari Kra, this is one of the the most you know, uh, explicit statements of, of the role of Midrash as he conceived of it, uh, or, the, or that I've seen in, in the Mepharshim. You should know that when the prophecy was written, it was written complete with all its solutions and everything it needs so that future generations should not stumble in it. It lacks nothing in its place to be fully understood. And there is thus no need to bring proof from another place nor from Midrash. So the Torah is whole and it was given to us in a state of wholeness or, or shlameless, I think is the, is the Hebrew word he uses, lacking nothing in it. Um, but the purpose of the Midrash of the sages is to enhance Torah and glorify it. So pausing here for one second, the Mahari Kra is, again, is what I call a radical Pashtun, someone who holds that you must be able to answer all questions just based on the text. And Midrash is valuable, but if you ever claim that I need Midrash to understand the Pshat, then it must mean that you've got the wrong Pshat, okay? Um, and the Midrash does enhance things. It might give you added insight into the Pshat, you know, uh, beyond... Uh, you know, beyond the questions that you've answered, it might give you the, these other moral or philosophical ideas, but it's not necessary. And then he says, he gives a little muscle here, one who does not know the pshat uh, of the psukim and nevertheless turns to its midrash is similar to one who is swept along by the torrents uh, as the depths of the sea overwhelm him and he grasps onto anything that comes to his hand to save himself. If only he had paid close attention to the word of God, he would have investigated after the resolution of the matter and its shot and would find it possible to fulfill that which was stated. If you seek it out like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand fear of Hashem and knowledge of God you will find. So his, he's actually saying more here. Not only is Midrash unnecessary to understand Pshat, but if you attempt to get involved in Midrash, without understanding Pshat, it could actually mislead you and take you away and endanger your understanding of the Torah. 
Um, okay, so those are the two categories here of of midrashe agada of non legalistic uh, midrashim. And to go back now to address what what uh, what Rabbi Zucker was saying is that um, that uh, what about when when the mafarshim will like fill in background information uh, that um, is not stated openly in the pesukim? You know what what you know? Uh, how would I classify that? So I would say that in 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 uh, I mean again, it's hard to work with without an example. But if I know what you're talking about, then uh, I would say that that's in shot oriented uh, midrashim. So it is midrash in the sense that that it's not stated openly in the pesukim, but they're putting together clues based on on. Uh, on you know textual implications or 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 hypotheses about the, the pasuk in order to give more information for understanding what God wanted to convey in the pasukim. Um, I don't know if that adequately answers your question, but that's uh, what I'd say. Yeah, I think. So. Oh, okay. sorry. No, go ahead, um, Moshe. Yeah, no, I, I guess what I'm just trying to to work through is to what extent is that type of information necessary for learning the shot of the psukim like in theory could you learn the shot without that and if so like does that take away from the idea that the shot is just the shot and the medrash is something yeah. that, like you know not as necessary for right. just learning the shot? yeah so th this is something that we've been exploring in our, our homage methodology here that um let's take for example uh two shot oriented mafarshan um shadal and uh and <laughs> Shadal and let's say uh, Rambam. I know he's not, he doesn't have a Pearson Torah. That's why I was hesitating. But so Rambam says that, you know, if there's anything in the Torah about Chukim that we don't understand, uh, it's because we lost knowledge of the practices of the Ovdiya Vodazara. You know, and if we had full knowledge of the practices of the Ovdi of Odazara, we would understand exactly what the Torah was getting at. You know, so the Ram and Ram says that you know he read all the books in Arabic on on idolatry, and like that gave him tremendous insight into the Chukim. You know, Shadal says the Torah stands alone, and you shouldn't need to make recourse to any other secular uh, um, uh, you know um, framework or, or or other sorts of chachmos in order to understand what the puzzle is saying. You know. Um, and so it seems to be even among people who are not taking a midrashic approach to the pesukim, the question is like, like, are you, you know, are you just relying on the words, or are you like supplementing it with other information that you have that's rooted in the words, you know, but like could be taken from other sources, you know? Like another example of this is like, you know, the Rabag sometimes will explain things based on the style of writers in ancient times. Like that's his explanation for why. Um, you know, uh, Vayakon, uh, not Vayakon Pukude. Yeah, Vayakon Pukude repeats stuff about the Mishkan, like that Truma or already says uh, in Parsha's Truma. So he says that, you know, the style of the ancient writers back then was to go into elaborate detail about constructions of things. And and it was a, a normal way of writing back then, you know, or let's say like modern scholars like Joshua Berman, you know, will will use their knowledge of like archaeology and history to fill in the gaps and help us understand the shot. So the question is like, is do we classify that as shot or do we classify that as like some other method or like outside of shot? And you're going to find a, a spectrum there. So it's not, not one, uh, not one approach. Uh, Leslie, you had a question or a comment? Yes. Um, uh, um, if the rush is uh, an explanation of the mind of the author. Yeah. Right. So wouldn't you say that um, like, uh, insofar as Tanakh is concerned. So yeah. just Torah, wouldn't you say that if uh, it says Rashi wrote his commentary with Ruch HaKodesh, that that would be the most valid commentary on the Torah? Well, first of all, uh, I'm always curious as to who says that, <laughs> you know. I, I, um, that's, a, that's a question. <laughs> right, I, I, well, let's, let's, say, let's we, say someone can say know, that. We all know it was said. But no one exactly right. knew where it came from. So I'm you asking see, you a question. You see, if though, that that didn't, tell, that didn't stop the Ramban from right. arguing with Rashi. That didn't stop any of the other Mepharshim from arguing with Rashi. You know, if Rashi wrote with Navua, that would be a different story, you know. But Ruch, the type of Ruach Akkurish I suspect they mean is, you know, some form of, of uh, you know, hypercharged intuition. You know, I guess I don't want to get drawn to a whole thing about what Ruach Akkurish is, but uh, you just see from the, the Masora that that didn't stop anyone from disagreeing with what anyone said, you know, uh, with Rashi and even Chazal, which we're going to see in a little while, that Chazal will give interpretations and we will see that those are, 
that non halakhic interpretations from Chazal are not binding in any way. Um, so that's, I think, a, a stronger case than, than with Rashi. Okay, so uh, hold on, hold on for, for us to see the sources on that. Okay, really quickly before we go into the, the, the next part of this, uh, I, just as I mentioned with, with Rabbi Fader's um, question about uh, Yuga Momidos, about the, you know, the 13 principles of deriving uh, halakhos. So there are two other categories of drush. Uh, which are midrash halacha, uh, halachic drushos. Um, and in my mind, I see them as two categories. There might be a third. One is Torah Shabal Peh, uh, which is elucidations of the legal meaning of the words in the Pasuk as given to Moshe by Hashem at Sinai. So for example, pre Eitz Hadar is a, an esrog that was given to Moshe at Sinai. So it's an interpretation of the Pasuk, but it, it was, it was a, a transmitted interpretation. That's authoritative. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have mnemonic, um, devices that Chazal will often give halachic drushos to help you remember halachos. And, uh, and again, this is because of the fact that you couldn't write down Torah Shabal Peh and everything has to be anchored in the text. And then maybe the in-between category, or maybe it's another category, is deriving new halachos using methods of Torah Shabal Peh and Yugam Midos or these other Midos Shatorah Nidreshos Behen. I don't know how to classify that, uh, and that's why I'm not addressing it. So, um, I'm just not addressing it, okay. but uh, I'm, I'm bringing it up in order to not address it because uh, I just don't know how those work. Okay, the next and last part of what we're doing today, which is going to take up the rest of the time, is um, is I mentioned that the problem. Is, oh, sorry, the problem is that students don't know the definition, uh, the distinction between pshat and drash. Okay, so so I the first step in, in 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 high school is I have to introduce them to that distinction. Oh, and by the way, I I, I got to give a background here just because I don't know who's listening to this is. So I taught at Shalhavet at a high school for girls for 10 years, but I was in the unique position of teaching every student in the school for multiple cl classes every year. So when I talk about this, I, I don't know if this could be done in one class, but I did this over the course of four years from ninth grade to 12th grade in like anywhere from any, any given student teaching them for let's say like eight to 10 classes. So what I'm about to show you is something that I was constantly reinforcing the entire student body for the entire four years. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's how I want it to be taken. So I'm calling these six guidelines for learning Midrash Agada, but I, I, I don't want you to think that I was like beating students over the head with these guidelines and saying like, no, you can't like disagree with these. These were, these just came up and whenever, you know, whenever uh, it became relevant, whenever student asked a question or a comment, we would revisit these guidelines, uh, mostly in my Tanakh classes, uh, uh, but sometimes in my Torah Balpeh classes also. So what we're gonna do is like this, and, and this is this is the, the plan for the remainder of, of the year today, okay? I'm gonna read each of the six guidelines, and then I'm going to try to overwhelm you with sources, okay? To show you how this is an undeniable part of the Masorah that the vast majority, if not everybody holds by, and that's why I'm gonna be drawing upon Ge'onim, Rishonim, and Acharonim. And the reason why I wanna overwhelm you with sources is uh, even though it's going to be belaboring the point, is number one again to introduce you to new sources that you've never seen, hopefully. And I, I, you know, because this problem, because problematic interpretations of midrash are so prevalent in the school systems, I feel like I'm going up against the tide when I present these guidelines to my students because they'll think, oh, that's just a weird Rabbi Schneeweiss thing. And I have to, I want to constantly show that no, 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 this is the Masora. And it's been forgotten or it's been overshadowed or it's been hijacked, you know, and and having and, and that's why I need to appeal to authority in this sense. Um, so so uh, and I just want you to experience that in case you need to show this to somebody or in case you yourself are in doubt about whether this is just a weird rubbish Shneeweiss thing or this is a real thing. OK, so here are the six guidelines in abstract and then we'll go through uh, the scripts for them. Rabbi Schneeweiss. Yes. Um, question is, yeah. um, uh, is any Midrash Agada Tor Shabal Peh? in contrast to Midrash Halacha? Okay, good question. So what I mean by Torah Shabal Peh in the context of this shir is Torah Shabal Peh would be halachic explanations given to Moshe at Sinai, okay? And that's the primary meaning. The secondary meaning is halachic teachings from Chazal that, uh, that, that, are, are, uh, that became part of the corpus of, uh, of, of the subject of halakha. In other words, anything having to do with halakha, I'm calling Torah Shabal Peh. And anything that does not have to do with halakha, I'm calling Agada. And we're going to see Mepharshim who make that, uh, that distinction. Um, and uh, and uh, regarding, again, regarding like halakhic midrashim, I would classify that as halakha. So the, the key question is, is it halakhic or non-halakhic? 
and halakhic, I'd say for our purposes, synonymous with Torah Shabal Peh, and non-halakhic is, uh, is we're calling Agada. But, but you, would you say that any of the Pshatim in Agada are straight from a teaching that Hashem gave Moshe? Absolutely not. And that's the first point. Okay, okay. so the first guideline is Midrashim, and again, when I say Midrashim, we're talking only Midrashim Agada. Midrashim are theories of Chazal. They were not given at Sinai. They are not the word of Hashem, and we are not obligated to accept them. Okay, and again, I'm going to give ample support for all these, but I just want to see, you to see them all in, in, a, in a shot here. Two, we do not rely on Midrashim for proof or disproof. Okay, meaning you cannot prove anything from a Midrash, and you cannot use a Midrash to disprove anything. Um, and the reasons why are A, their theories, that's based on the above. B, they are not unanimous. Uh, that's also based on the above, that, that a Midrash, when you see a Midrash in the name of, uh, of uh, any particular Chacham, all you can infer is that that Chacham had the idea. Uh, you cannot say that he was teaching, let's say, unlike in Torah Shabbat, where you see a, uh, you know, you know, Rabbi Akiva says something uh, that's a halakha, you, the default assumption is to assume that it, it goes back to Harsinai, unless, you know, it's challenged or something like that. But with Midrash, you only have the right to assume that it was the person who, who said it. And then C is they're cryptic. So you don't even know if you understand it, which is another reason why you don't rely on it for proof or disproof. Three. We should only take from Midrashim what makes sense to our own minds. There's no virtue or obligation to believe a Midrash which doesn't make sense. Okay, that's probably the most radical of them. Four, Midrashim were written to teach us ideas. The purpose is not to provide us with facts, history, or amusement. Um, five, Midrashim were not meant to be taken at face value. Uh, and the reason why, oh, sorry, I, I, uh, I'll read. They, they must be analyzed, interpreted, and decoded. Many of them were not meant to be taken literally, but as metaphors, allegories, or riddles. The reason why I, I phrase this as they're not meant to be taken at face value instead of, like, I think what we are common, we commonly say is you, you don't take Midrashim literally. But if you look at Avram ben Aramam's essay on Drashos, which I have a bunch of fear on if you're interested, um, he, he says that there are Midrashim that you take as allegories, but then there are Midrashim that are literal, but they're deeper than the surface meaning. So that's why I prefer the phrase, don't take them at face value. I mean, you might take them literally, but there's a lot deeper uh, ideas there. Um, and, and in six, if a midrash doesn't make sense to us, we shouldn't reject it or mock it. Instead, we should say, I don't know what it means, and then return to it when our minds are more developed. So let us go on a, uh, a source tour, okay? And again, interrupt me at any point. A lot of these are going to be uh, overlapping here. Uh, and so if you have a question, we'll stop and, and talk about it. And I might say that it's going to be addressed in a later source. So yes, 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 yes. Just, and I apologize if the timing is bad. I don't know when to jump. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. What, is, what about a medrash like, like, like you, I think you mentioned it in the list at the beginning, like Avram and the Kivshan Aish, which right. seems to be like very sort of widely accepted as being historically, literally true and like yeah. forms like a strong basis about Avram in terms of the Nisionos. Like it seems mm -hmm. to be like sort of, I don't know if I call it foundational, but like very widely accepted and right. sort of like important and widely accepted as historical. Yeah. Like, is that, is that a different categorization? Uh, maybe not qualitatively, but like, should, should we treat that differently in the context of the way you're describing great, it? Great question. I mean, there you also have a, you know, you have a uh, mach locus in Mepharshim about how, to, let, so let's call that, let's call those, um, uh, we should coin the term for it. Um, <laughs> historical midrashim i don't know i don't know what to call it you know that, that are giving us pieces of uh of, of of like backstory that seem like they're their actual events you know so you will have uh you know mafarshim who take those as fact that were passed down you know like Ram ramban and uh, and rashi take that as fact as far as i know uh and then you'll have others who take it out uh as uh, an allegory you know like the um, Abravanel brings down, I think he actually agrees with Ramban and Rashi that it happened, but I think he brings down that, I might be mistaken on this, maybe it's someone else, that it doesn't mean that he was thrown into a fiery furnace and was miraculously saved. It's that he was Chayev Srefa, that he incurred um, the death penalty. And in that society, then it was uh, being burned. Uh, and um, and like, and then he got out of that. So they take it non non literally in terms of the absolute literal sense. Ramam also in Hilos of Odazara says a similar thing that that he the the king wanted to kill him, and like a miracle was was done, and he escaped. Ramam doesn't say he was thrown into a uh, into a fiery furnace, you know. But the way I've seen Mefarshim take these things is you don't have to accept them. Now, should you accept like should you accept them as historical fact? 
you know, um, that's really up to you in terms of how much weight you give to these things. But like, there are plenty of examples like uh, where where you have something that's like passed down. Let's say like the notion that you know Yocheved was born uh, on, on the borderline going into Mitzrayim, and that's you know to answer the question of like there were seventy souls, you know. And Chazal say this. They say they Chazal say explicitly that a miracle was done. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. They say Yocheved was born between you know on the borderline, and then the question is. Uh, According to that reasoning, then Yocheved must have been very old when she gave birth to Moshe. And Chazal say it was a miracle. So Rashi and Ramban take that literally. And Rabag and Ibn Ezra say, no, if it was if, if this miracle actually happened, the Pesukim would have said it. So when Chazal say it happened, they say it was a miracle. Even they didn't mean it as a historical thing. So you have this diversity in terms of what do we do with these like historic midrashim? You know, do we take that as like facts that were passed down? Uh, or do we treat it like any other midrash where... It's teaching an idea. It's not necessarily factual. It's not necessarily authoritative. You know, uh, you give further, you know, more weight to the actual text in the psukim. So that's that's machlokus. Uh, thank you. Yes. What about like ignoring the particular form, whether it's a kivshan ha'ish or yeah. some other phenomenon, but the fact that Avram Vino argued on the of the and was right. saved by God is that. Right. Is that part of the from Sinai, or is that just a, a made up interpreted theory by Chazal? Right. So it's it, I I it's a good question, and um and I don't know if it's that binary. You know, like let's say like we know that Avram Avinu, um, you know, um, uh, was uh on the level to get Navua in the, despite the fact that he was on in, in Orkastin, you know. Um, and that he had the correct idea of Hashem, and that he taught, you know, you know, as a nefesh Hashem asu b'charan, he taught people. How do you know? Do these, you know, uh, these backstories about Avraham and how he rejected the Vodazara and stuff, and how, how he came to this? Were are those like facts that were passed down, or are they like like speculations that are, you know? Um, I guess uh, giving concrete forms to true assumptions, but we don't know the particular details. Like we weren't around at the time of Avram Ravino. Like we don't know, you know, like it, it, it's, so how were those passed down if they were, you know? Like, I, I just, I, I honestly don't know. Um, and uh, like, let's say like the, someone asked me recently, and if anyone can answer this, please let me know. The, the detailed um, history of Avodah Zarah that the Ramam gives in the first parak of, of Avodah Zarah, you know, where's the Ramam get that from? I don't know, <laughs> you know, like, you know, so I, I honestly don't know what to make of these things. And, um, and given the fact that they are non-halachic in nature, then there's nothing forcing us to say that they come from Sinai, you know, um, I, I, I think, again, I'm going to intend to, to show that, that that's the case. Um, but uh, yeah, this is part of the question. I should have said at the outset also, by the way, there are a lot of unanswered questions here. Part of this is just open up the sugya, but um, yeah, I don't know what to make of those. But you're suggesting that in, in number one, that yeah. when Hashem told Moshe at Har Sinai about uh, Avram Vina's life, that he didn't tell him anything about any background or there was no, that was not given at Har Sinai. Correct. That's what I'm assuming here. And then I'm, but I'm also assuming though that the Jews in Mitzrayim, when they got to Mitzrayim from Yaakov Avinu, had knowledge of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, and like that became part of the legacy. And, it, and it's conceivable that they passed down certain things and that those things continue to be passed down after Torah was given, you know? But I'm, I am saying that they're not from Sinai. Yeah. Yeah. Someone says that Avram Avinu didn't smash the idols from his father, you know, and like make up that whole story. I wouldn't say that they're a covert Torah. Uh, Rabbi Shneweis? Yeah. Uh, so when you say that the Midrash is not from Sinai, you're not to, trying to say that it's not like as historically accurate as the things we see from Sinai. You're saying it doesn't have the weight and authority of Nemuus Moshe Rabbeinu at Har Sinai. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, thank you. In the interest of time, I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm happy to take questions, but I, I am also fearful and, and mindful of the time. So let me just go through a bunch of sources really quickly, just to show you. So this is not just this whole thing. So that you're not just relying on what I'm saying. So let's let's see it from the words themselves. So best source, in my opinion, is Shmuel Hanagid. Okay, in the Mavoha Talmud, you can find it in every uh, edition of Brachos. So he's defining all these terms in in in, in Shah. So he says Hagada, or what we call Agada, or Agadata, or Agadic Midrash, is any explanation from the Talmud on a non mitzvah topic. This is Haggadah, and we only learn from it that which makes sense. Okay, Shmuel Nagid is an early Rishon, okay, or late, he's not a Gaon, early Rishon, yeah. 
it is incumbent upon you to know that anything established by the sages as halacha regarding any mitzvah was received by Moshe Rabbeinu who received it from the Almighty, and we should not add to it nor subtract from it. But as for all of the explanations of scriptural verses, each of the sages explained according to the ideas which occurred to him and what he saw with his mind. We should only learn from these explanations that which makes sense, and the rest we should not rely upon. Okay, so here you have, first of all, the distinction between agada and halacha. Okay, that's the distinction I was making. You also have the point about how it is each theory from that individual chazal, their, their own theories. And then you also have the guideline of you only learn from it that which makes sense. Okay, and you don't rely on stuff that doesn't make sense to you. So that's the first three of my principles here. Okay, then you have Rav Hirsch. Now, Rav Hirsch has two ways uh, of presenting this. One is the less harif way, and then the one's the more harif way. So in Horeb, which is his work on mitzvos, he says... Um, that there will be, um, uh, uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time here. Okay, this is the part that we want to get to. Uh, he's saying that there are two schools of, of study, like two subject matters, okay? So he says, the work of the first school lies before us in the Shmaitza, to use the bad Ashkenazic pronunciation, Shmaitza. I don't know why the I comes in there, but uh, made up of things heard, Shema. The work of the second we find in the Agadita, made up of the ideas which have occurred to each one of what he has related, like Lahagid, okay? Everything belonging to the first school, meaning anything that is uh, in Shmaitza, which uh, he said before is halakhic, is obligatory because it emanates from the authority which has the power to bind. Uh, the authority of God, the authority of Torch of All that springs from the second school has no power to bind because it represents only the views of individuals and can claim recognition only insofar as it is in conformity with what is contained in the work of the very first school. The work of the first school, from the very nature of its contents, came to an end with the completion of the Gemara, the collection of the Shmaitza. The production of Agadita is, however, free and capable of enlargement at all times. It is all the freer, the more firmly established and self-contained the work is of the second of the first school, and the second and the less the first school is exposed to any change from the second. That was a complicated sentence, but we're not going to dwell on that. The first school should rather serve as a standard regulating the second. Okay, but the main point here is is that that the uh, the second one has no binding power. But now this is where he says it in the more harif way. This is the letters on Agarita, which if you haven't read this, you have to read it. It's not it was not included in the Rav Hirsch collected works, uh, but it's available in English. I can send it to you if you're interested. So he's writing to someone, I think it was a fellow educator. You are of the opinion that the Agados, again, Agadata, were received by Moshe from, uh, from God at Sinai, and that there is no distinction in this respect between them and the halakhic statements that were transmitted. As far as my limited mind can grasp, this is a dangerous approach that poses a grave danger for the pupils who grow up believing this concept, for it very nearly opens the gates of heresy before them. So in other words, if you don't make the distinction between halakha and Agada, it's dangerous. How so? What should these wretches do if they hear from their teachers today, Agadic statements were transmitted at Sinai like the main body of Torah, and then they discover the declarations of the greatest of the early Talmudic commentators upon whom all Jewry relies, in which one of them says, Agadic statements are not articles of faith, but are reasonable assumptions. And another says, and that's a statement from, from, um, from the, uh, I, I actually did not include that in my, in my presentation. I forgot who it was. And another says they were stated as ex exaggerations or as one man speaks to another making statements that are not intended to be true, but to entertain their listener for a while. Uh, or they narrated what they had dreamed or learn from God only things that make sense and so on. What are these wretches to do when they read these and similar declarations about statements they were taught by their teachers to believe came from Sinai with no difference between them and the main body of Torah. So this was the Feynman problem is that if you're not taught to differentiate between Halakha and Agada, and then you find statements like this that, oh, you don't have to believe Agada and like, oh, it's just exaggerations and stuff. So now what do you do? Like if it's all one type of content, then you're not going to take Halakha seriously either. They will find themselves in great spiritual danger, ready to reject both equally and to accept only what their little brains can comprehend. Now he makes an extreme statement in which I don't know if he's being hyperbolic because this is too extreme for me. It would be better for them to not study Torah and mitzvahs in depth and simply to keep the mitzvahs by rote rather than tread this dangerous path. Okay, which is why it is, in my humble opinion, it is my humble opinion that we are not to budge from the road of life shown to us by our Rishonim when they made a major and intrinsic distinction between the statements made as transmissions from God to Moshe and statements made as a Gada. The former were transmitted from master to disciple, and their original source is a human ear hearing from the mouth of Moshe who heard it at Sinai. The latter, though transmitted from master to disciple, for many Agadic statements are introduced by a disciple in the name of his master, and sometimes even in the name of the master's master, have their origin in what the originating scholar stated as his own opinion in accord with his broad understanding of Tanakh and the ways of the world, or as statements of Mus Musr and fear of God to attract his audience to Torah and Mitzvot. So again, very clear from Rapersh that these are individual theories of Chazal, they have no uh, binding authority. Next source, and we're going to go through a couple of short ones now. 
this is from the Kabbalah Yair and Akron. Once we know that a matter is not a practical halacha, without a doubt, it is not relevant to say that it is a re received tradition. Again, that's the litmus test. Is it halacha? Then it's possible that it was received. Again, again, depending on whether it's midrabanan, deraisa. But if it's not halacha, it, you don't say that it's a received tradition. Um, so again, it's theories of Chazal not received. Abravanel uh, says that which was said by way of drash and asmachta was not received from Sinai, for sometimes Chazal mentioned by way of mnemonic device and asmachta, and we are not obligated to believe that the Pshat of the Puzzle and its true interpretation are such, meaning it was not, not received from Sinai. Um, again, theories of Chazal. Uh, Sadigon says, uh, so this is a quote in the Otar HaGaonim, uh, we don't rely on, nor do we bring proof from any Divrei Agada, nor do we raise objections based on Divrei Agada. So again, we don't try to prove or disprove anything from Agada. Rukhshri Ragon, custodian, the chronicler of the Masora, says, these statements which are expounded from Pesukim and are called Midrash and Agada are theories. Some of them are true in a literal sense, but many of them are not. Therefore, we don't rely on Divrei Agada. The valid ones are those which are supported by rationality and scripture. There's no end or limit to Agados, meaning that it's not like we received a certain you know, uh, uh, set amount. So here he's really commenting on principles one, two, three, and five, okay, all in one. Um, Shmuel ben Chofni Gaon, another one of the Gaon, this one's quoted by the Radak. I think we don't have the safer from Shmuel ben Chofni. Uh, this is the explanation of Shmuel ben Chofni, who said that even though the implications of the statements of Chazal and the Gemara are true, this is talking about Shmuel, uh, uh, the resurrection of Shmuel by the, the, uh, the Balas Ov. So the, the statements of Chazal and the Gemara are true that the woman resurrected Shmuel. We don't accept statements in places where they contradict rationality because Radak holds that she didn't actually get resurrected, uh, didn't actually resurrect him. So again, Chazal say that she did, but we only accept what is based on, on, uh, on rationality here. So again, we don't prove things. We can say, oh, Chazal said it as a Midrash. It must be true. Uh, and we only take what makes sense from our mind. By the way, going through all these sources made me really understand why when Rebbe has given shear so many times, someone he'll be giving shear on a topic, someone will bring up a midrash and he'll just like dismiss it, you know, because every midrash is its own idea. You can't prove stuff from midrashim. You can't disprove some stuff from midrashim. So it's almost like, I mean, maybe this is me projecting onto Rebbe, which, you know, I, I don't know if I'm the only one that bad, but, uh, but like sometimes he has, he, he will regard the statement, like he'll be giving a sheer explaining one midrash or something like that. Someone will quote another midrash and it'll be like an annoying fly because it has nothing to do with this sheer and don't think that you're at all like adding anything by it or like disproving anything. It's each, each midrash is its own theory. It would be like, you know, like if, if, um, like if you treated all shearing given by all people as one body of evidence and like, like, you know, Rabbi Fader giving shear and then you're like, oh, I heard a shear once that does something different. Ha ha, like that disproves you. No, it doesn't disprove you. People give different shearim, you know, same thing here. Different midrashim have different authors and have different ideas. Uh, Rav Haigon, so we're still in the Gonim here. Know that Dibri Agada are not like teachings from Torah Shabal Peh, explicitly. Rather, each one expounded on what occurred to his own mind. They were stated in the manner of, it is possible that, or one might say, not as a clear-cut matter, meaning it's conjecture. Therefore, we don't rely on them. So he's saying we don't rely on them because they weren't even stated with certainty by the authors. It was conjecture, it was svara, it was an opinion. Um, Ibn Ezra, the sum of the matter is what the Gaonim said about Drush. We don't raise objections against it or from it. Rashba, these are only Debrei Agada and we don't bring objections based on them. Ritva, how could we abandon all these statements that were stated as halakha on account of that which was stated as Debrei Agada? Rather, it is certain that since these are Debrei Agada and we don't bring objections based on them. Um, Ramban, we don't bring objections based on Divrei Agada. Again, all these things, we just don't bring disproofs. Now, one more from the Ramban, and this is the cool one because he actually like practices what he preaches. I mean, obviously everyone does, but so in the disputation, in the Vikuah, so Ramban is arguing with Friar Paul and Friar Paul is trying to prove to him that Jesus is the Messiah, right? So Friar Paul brings a Midrash that he thinks indicates that Jesus is the Messiah, okay? That I think it says that, that the Messiah was born when the temple was destroyed, okay? Which uh, timing doesn't exactly work out, but whatever. So Ramban says, uh, I arose and said, listen, all you peoples. Friar Paul asked me if the Mashiach about whom the prophet spoke had already arrived. Uh, I answered that he has not arrived. He then brought a book of Agada, which stated that on the day the base of Mikdash was destroyed, the Mashiach was born. Now, if you are someone who takes Midrash as Torah Messini, this is going to be very, very disturbing to you. Okay. But Ramban was not one of those people. I responded, I don't believe in this Midrash. And then he classifies, know that we have three types of books. The first is the Biblia, okay? This is in Spain, right? So the Biblia, which is the Bible, which all of us believe with complete conviction. The second is called Talmud, which is an explanation of the mitzvahs of the Torah, for there are 613 mitzvahs in the Torah and not a single one of them is unexplained in the Talmud, and we believe in it. 
i.e. the Talmud in its explanation of the mitzvahs. So that's what we are calling Torah Shabal Peh, meaning stuff that was received from Sinai that has to do with halacha. We also have a third book called Midrash or Sermones, sermons in English. For example, when a clergyman gets up and delivers a sermon and it is deemed to be good by one of the people who hears it and he writes it down. So those are the three books. Bible, Torah Shabal which we all believe in. Talmud, Torah Shabal Peh, which we all believe in. And then sermons or Midrash, which were ideas that each individual rabbi came up with and then wrote down. Okay, now look at what the Ramban, Ramban says. Regarding the contents of this third book, if one believes in it, that is good. But if one doesn't believe in it, then it will not harm him. We have sages who wrote that Mashiach will not be born until the, close to the end of times when he comes to bring us out of exile. Therefore, I don't believe in what this book says that he was born the day of the destruction. So again, Ramban is saying you're not a kofar if you, uh, if you don't believe a particular midrash. Uh, and he's saying that there are other Midrashim, and I believe those, and I don't believe this one. So again, these are the theories of the individual Chazal. You don't bring proofs from it or disproofs, etc. cetera. Um, uh, another one, uh, again, Ramam writes about this a lot, but I wanted to choose one that wasn't as well known. So in the letter to about uh, astrology, um, the people he was writing to, the, the sages who he was writing to, um, <laughs> proofs from, uh, from Midrashim that indicate that astrology is real, okay? So the Ramam has this very sharp um, uh, 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 piece of muster here. He says, our opinion about this is from the outset is that all the words of the stargazers are false in the opinion of every science-minded individual. I know that it's possible that you may search and find sayings of some individual sages in the Talmud and Midrashim whose words appear to maintain that at the moment of a man's birth, the stars will cause such and such to happen to him. Okay, so you're gonna find a Midrash that supports astrology. Do not let this be difficult in your eyes. For it is not the proper method for a man to abandon the accepted law and raise once again the counter arguments and replies that preceded its enactment. Meaning, we've established now through science that astrology is false. So it's not a rational thing to go back to an earlier time and like bring up prior rejected, you know, prior beliefs that we have now disproven. But then here's where he says the, the principles that we care about here. Similarly, it is not proper to abandon matters of reason that have already been verified by proofs, shake one's hand loose of them, and rely on the words of a single one of the sages who was possibly ignorant of the matter at the time, or it is possible that there is an allusion to a hidden idea in those words, or they may have been said based on the time and the circumstances before him. Now, those are three, three reasons why you should not take a statement of Chazal as Torah, as, as, as Halakha Lemosh Sinai, because again, Possible that that the, the the sage who who said this astrological belief was ignorant of the reality of astrology. Again, the whole world believed in astrology back then, and again, Ram couldn't say this if if he held that this was from Sinai. Okay, so this sage was coming up with his own theory, and he was ignorant, or he knew that astrology wasn't real, but he was giving an illusion. You know, to uh, it was a muscle or it was a deeper idea, something like that. You know, like for example, there are many. Um, I, I've heard Rebbe give interpretations of statements that seem to indicate belief in astrology, but he explained them in a psychological way, you know? Um, so, you know, it's possible that that was, that was uh, the, the idea, or it's possible that he was saying it based on the circumstances before him. So there's a famous example where uh, I think it was Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, I think, made, uh, so there's a statement in the Gemara that says, uh, there was a woman in Mitzrayim who gave birth to 600,000 people, okay? And if you just took that statement in isolation, it sounds like a miracle, okay? But then if you look at it in the context of the Gemara, I think it was Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was giving shear uh, to a bunch of people, like to the, to the masses, and they were dozing off. So he wanted to say something to shock them out of their sleep. So he said, there was a woman in Mitzrayim who gave birth to 600,000 people, and they all like, like woke up. And he said, who was that? That was Yocheved, who gave birth to Moshe, and Moshe was equal to all the Jews combined. You know, So there, it was like he said this statement in a crazy way, not because it was true, but because he wanted to wake people up. You know, like it was said for a particular reason. Um, so that's what the Ramam says here. Again, all these these uh, principles are reflected in it. Um, last point, and then we'll, 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 I guess, take questions and wrap it up. Um, this principle number six, that if the Midrash doesn't make sense to us, we shouldn't reject it or mock it. I decided not to bring... <laughs> Uh, a lot of, uh, of statements from uh, from uh, the Mepharshim for this particular year, because I think we all know this, that you shouldn't just dismiss Midrashim. But the, 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 my favorite of those statements is the Ramam when he's describing the group that relates to Midrashim properly. He says, there is a third group. This group consists of people to whom the greatness of Chazal is clear. They recognize the superiority of Chazal's intelligence from their words, which point to exceedingly profound truths. The members of this group understand that Chazal clearly knew uh, oops, typo, knew the impossibility of that which is impossible and the necessity of that which is necessarily true. 
They know that Chazal did not speak nonsense and that it is clear to them that the words of Chazal contain both a surface level meaning and a hidden meaning. Thus, whenever Chazal spoke of things that seem impossible, they were employing the style of riddle and parable, um, which is the method of the truly great thinkers. For example, the greatest of our wise men began his book by saying to understand an analogy and a metaphor, the words of the wise and their riddles. Again, that's saying Chazal were trying to teach ideas. They're not to be meant to be taken at face value and that you shouldn't reject it. You should try to understand it. And if you can't, then, uh, you know, leave it, come back to it. No obligation to accept it uh, if it doesn't make sense. And uh, that is, uh, you know, that's the, the takeaway message here. So. Uh, just to wrap it up, uh, and I, I tried to find a nicer word than reprogramming, but it really is reprogramming. It's trying to replace the programming from their elementary school um, through these guidelines. And I wanted to give a sense of how how it was this how would this look like in the class. So the way it would look like is we would go over these principles when they came up, but but I would often just say when a student would ask a question, that's just a midrash. And I uh, you know and what I wanted to convey to my students was. What, what could I mean when I say that's just a midrash? Number one, it's a theory, it's not a fact, and it's not the word of Hashem. That's the clear distinction. Two, we don't bring midrash in for proof or disproof. Three, that doesn't make sense to me, so I'm not going to accept it. Sometimes that's what I, I would say to like reject a crazy sounding midrash. Four, we need to figure out what idea the midrash is teaching us, not just quote the midrash verbatim without understanding. If you're just quoting the midrash, that's not how, how Chazal intended midrashim to be used. We have to understand, that's a midrash, we have to understand it. Five, that midrash isn't meant to be taken at face value or it's not meant to be taken literally. Six, we might not be able to grasp the meaning of the midrash now, but maybe one day we'll be on the level to understand. And what I try to do, and I do not, I'm not doing this in this uh, shear, but, but in high school, you know, when a student would, come, would, would bring a midrash into, let's say, a, a chumashir that I gave, and I, most of my chumashir and focus on pshat, we would save the midrash for the end of the unit. And I would try to figure to find Mefarshim on the Midrash so I could walk them through what it looks like to learn a Midrash inside. Because, you know, people ask, like, what is the correct Der Halimu to learn Midrashim? And the answer is we don't know it, but the best we can do is learn, you know, the Rashba on Midrashim and the Me'iri and the Maharsha and the Torah Tamima and learn from the, the, the great Bali Masora who did know how to learn Midrash and then develop an intuition for Midrash from them to the point where we could do it on our own. And so I, I, I don't, my hopes, my hope is not that that a high school student could develop that in high school because I, I I'm still working to develop that now. But I feel like the more examples of good midrash interpretation we show them, the more they'll get into their mind, like the you know get a, a sense of what midrashim should be like, and uh, and a combination of those two things, a combination of making a clear demarcation between midrash and pshat, and then constantly reinforcing these guidelines, I think will allow students to. Uh, not fall into the uh, the Feynman uh, midrashic betrayal trap. So um, takeaways from this, and I'll take questions uh, afterwards. Takeaways are uh, that I want everyone to, <laughs> to have is just the basic distinction between thought being the intended meaning of the author and midrash being taking the words of the author and utilizing them to express an, another idea. Sometimes an idea that gives you insight into the shot, or it could be an idea that has nothing to do with the shot, and that's the midrashic agada. And then these six, uh, these six guidelines, which I hope I've shown you, again, I'm not quoting every single person, but I hope I've shown you enough sources to convince you that like, yeah, if we don't take Midrashim for, uh, if we don't, uh, what do you call it, rely on them for proof, there are ample Rishonim Gonim and Achron who hold that, you know? And like, they're not from Sinai. Yeah, there's ample sort of support for that. And, uh, and, and that's the method. And there are a lot of, uh, lot of questions that are unanswered. Again, like I think the questions raised here about historic Midrashim are valid question of like, what do you do when you, when you have something like, um, you know, something that is not exactly halakhic, but is also not exactly, uh, 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 you know, uh, like a drush on a pasuk. For example, Rav Simlai, right, is the only source, as far as I know, of the notion that there's 613 mitzvos, right? And you have people like the Rambam who take that at face value, you know, that he meant there are exactly 613, you know, and then you have people who hold, like Ibn Ezra and the Rabbah, who hold that, no, that's just a midrash, you know, and that there are not 613. There are more, or there are less, or there are, we don't know how many there are, or there's not a concept of a distinct number. And then you have people like the Ramban, who, who express both opinions and say that maybe this was just Rav Simlai's opinion, you know, and this is not a thing, you know. Now, you go to any Jew and you say, like, 613 mitzvos, is this a unanimous belief in Judaism? Most of them, you'll, they'll say yes, you know. But like in reality, it's not a unanimous thing, you know. Uh, it, it's Rav Simlai's statement, and like, 
And if you look at that statement in context, you see that right afterwards, it says that, you know, WML came along and reduced them to uh, 11, I think it was, then someone else came along and reduced it. Like, you know, it's just a mistake to treat them here. Someone is unmuted, but, or right, whatever. Um, it, it's just a, uh, there's so many statements that have crept in that we take as Allah Allah Moshim Sinai or Torah Shabal Peh that really should be classified as agaritas. And yeah, that raises uncomfortable questions uh, about how widely accepted they are. But I think that it's better to be faced with those questions and like, you know, uh, than, than to, to misclassify things. Um, so that, that's, that's the fear. If there are any questions, then I'll take them. I have a, a, just a Chinuch question on that. Sure. So in terms of reprogramming somebody who learned in elementary school that, you know, Medrash can be taken literally, yeah. how do you walk the fine line between, you know, giving the giving a better understanding of what Medrash is and, you know, Ooh. these well-meaning teachers who taught them many right. important aspects of Yahadas that, they, that, right. uh, that are true and you, you don't want them to be mocking their teachers and disregarding right. everything they taught them. Right. So how, so how do you walk that line? That's a really important question that, uh, that um, the, the, the not fun answer is that it has to be on a case by case basis. Like you have to know your students really well. You have to know how, you know, you know, sorry, I'm just going to do something really quickly. I'm going to, someone is not muted. I'm just going to mute everybody and you can unmute if you need to. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so um, it, it's a very delicate process. It has to be done with respect to their elementary school teachers, which I often will, I will often start off by saying that there are, uh, there are many views in Judaism, you know, and there are people who hold that Agatha is given at Sinai, you know, and I'll say that many times if I see that the, the, the kid is like, you know, uh, in, in a state of, uh, of trauma, you know, <laughs> but uh, so I'll, I'll start off by acknowledging that there are different approaches and that this is my understanding and that at the end of the day, then you have to take whichever approach makes most sense to you. That's one, like just prefacing it by saying that there is, there are different opinions in Judaism. Second thing is just knowing, you know, <laughs> knowing how they're going to take it emotionally. And then like just using that to, like there are kids who will hear this and be relieved. And then there are kids who will hear this and be, you know, and be horrified. And if they're in the same room, you have to like navigate, like, you know, how do I like validate the feelings of this kid who has always suspected that these things are not actually like literal without like destroying the kid who's, 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 uh, who is, you know, who put all of her trust in her, in her elementary school teacher. Yeah, it, it's, I, I, it's hard to say it's, it's case by case basis. And I think in an ideal world, then this is something that parents would do at home from an earlier age, you know, in step with the elementary school education of, of their children. I know that there are parents in, in our community who have done that. Uh, I just don't know because I really don't know much about the um, about elementary school education. Um, so maybe that's more of a question for parents of, of uh, who have had younger kids who have been in situations like this. I only get like- yeah, I think that- Yeah. Well, I think the elementary school education to tie your theory towards practice is to ensure that, especially by middle school, people, uh, students are taught examples. They see how you develop a shot around a puck. Then you see how like in Miguel Esther, sometimes from Midrash, you have background information that helps you understand the shot. Like Vashti was a, uh, you know, from royalty, which was not, so that starts to help you understand some of the tension. And then you show other examples of Midrashim that teach other abstract ideas and develop those in their full fruition. And I think even as early as middle school, if you can teach students those examples, they come up with the foundation that you're describing, and then they can then relate to the different aspects of Torah. So I think it's absolutely uh, feasible based on your yeah, framework. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good, um, a good uh, answer. And I, you know, I'm really bad at knowing where students come from to, came to our high school from. Like I, I, I always forget who comes from which school, but I know that, that um, there's a school, I, I don't know anything about the school other than, than what I'm about to say, that Har Torah, some reason produces students where the students come into high school with a healthy grasp of what midrashim are and what their place is, and they appreciate them, but they know that midrashim are not shot. And they're doing, you know, what Rabbi Aronson just said. You know, they must be doing it somehow, and I assume it's through, you know, through early exposure in a, in a way that's on the on the kids' level. And, uh, you know, and uh, yeah. Um, again, this is really more of a question for elementary school and middle school teachers. Uh, 
uh, you know, I mean, because I, I just go based on intuition of, 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 of the kid and, and, and in the moment. So sorry, I can't answer that more, Ayala. Rabbi Schneeweiss. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for making the obvious such a good lesson. Okay, good. And, <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> I'm glad it's obvious and that it was a good lesson. <laughs> yeah. And, in, and not to belabor it, but I think it's also important to point out that a, a good and true teacher will be able to convey the, the concepts of intellectual honesty and humility and um, such and such uh, ideas to the student and, and of course, Avisa Brios. So right. that these ideas can be appropriately corrected and uh, utilized, put in their right. toolbox, so to speak. Yes, that's that's an important thing. And in fact, I just want to share with you on that note, um, the conclusion of Rapers' letter uh, his last point, hold on, he says, um, I wish to add one more point. In my opinion, an essential rule for every person who teaches our Holy Torah, whether Tanakh or Halakha or Agada, that is, get into the habit of saying, I don't know. It is not within the teacher's power, nor is it his obligation to know everything and to resolve every difficulty. Even Chazal left a number of matters unresolved, all the more so lesser people like ourselves. Let us admit unashamedly before our pupils, this is something we do not know. Um, and, uh, and, and then he, he, this actually is relevant as well. This could be <laughs> guidelines for teachers more than students. We must be extremely cautious not to create a forced explanation for a verse or a statement in Agada or a statement in the Talmud simply in order to cover our ignorance. When we admit that we do not know, our pupils learn to humble themselves before the wisdom of Chazal and all the more so before the statements of God and the expressions of his Holy Spirit. Uh, they will then, uh, they will learn from us to regard Chazal upon a lofty pedestal and to sit in the dust at their feet. Uh, let them learn from us that there's nothing wrong with our fail with our faith if we fail to understand everything Chazal said. Let them learn from us to take great laborious pains to, pe to penetrate to the depths of their words and to draw wisdom and understanding, knowledge and muster from their wellsprings using straight reasoning, which may be hopefully true or at least close to their intent. How that, however, which our intelligence can only understand by employing distortions, let us leave that for minds greater than ours and not lay nonsense on Chazal's doorstep. Every distorted explanation, which we instinctively recognize as impossible to be true, perverts the pupil's thinking and denigrates the glory of Chazal. It makes them arrogantly certain that there is nothing they are incapable of understanding, leads them away from the straightforward way of study, and teaches them to our foolish opinions instead of the wisdom of Chazal. Um, so that, I, I think that uh, accords with what Ravi was saying there about the importance of demonstrating intellectual honesty and humility and respect of other people in dealing with these problems. And it also reminds me of a point that the first time I went through the Ramam's three groups in terms of the three ways people relate to uh, Agata. Uh, the first time I went through it, first time I went with, with, with you, with you, Ravi. First time I went through it with Rav Pesach. Uh, then you know we we went over the three groups: the people who take Chazal literally and then believe impossible things and take stuff, you know, uh, in you know, take stuff as literal that uh, that can't actually be true. Second group is people who take Chazal literally and mock them. And then the third group being what we read in the Rambam, people who understand that the words of Chazal have a deeper significance. I remember Rav Pesach asked, um, you know, what is the, what unites the first two groups, you know? Uh, and so I remember that I, I said that they both take Chazal literally, but then, you know, one group praises Chazal for it and one group denigrates it. And that's true. But I remember, but what Rav Pesach said was that the first two groups don't hold that Chazal are Chachamim. And I thought that that was a really interesting way to put it, that the first group thinks that they're admiring Chazal, you know, because they, they verbally and, and emotionally, they admire them. But really what they're doing is they're basically saying that the only thing that Chazal are saying is something that I can, can, uh, can get with my own mind. In other words, there's nothing that Chazal are saying that I'm not understanding, which means that Chazal's mind you know, is, is basically no different than my mind, you know? And the second group is definitely doing that. The second group is actually putting Chazal down for their, uh, for their intelligence. And I think that that's like one of the things that refers is emphasizing that anytime you give a bad explanation for Chazal and you patch up your own ignorance with, with, uh, you know, with a forced explanation, you're really warping the student's sense of what true Chachma is. Better to just like say, like Chazal are saying something that is beyond me that I can't understand. And at least then you're preserving the realm of true Chachma and not corrupting their intuition. Um, so yeah, very, very delicate, uh, delicate process. Any other questions? Um, I just had a reflection on uh, the way you said that you would like talk to students about uh, about Midrashim. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, um, 
it, the way that you talked about it walks a delicate balance between not um, not undermining their relationship to what they've heard, mm-hmm. but um, but removing the like um, like strength behind the strength isn't the right word. They they're like um, I'd say like strong attachment to that as like a sort like those statements as like authoritative. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that process is best described as a weaning. You have to wean them off of it. But again, it, certain things you can truly wean them off of in terms of a gradual process. Here, I feel like because of the, you know, either you re, you think that Midrash comes from Sinai or not, there is going to be a shock at some point, no matter what, to their system, you know, from these principles here. Um, and so like that is, yeah, it's try and walk a delicate line uh, 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 and uh, and not like take everything away from them without giving them stuff. But um yeah, it's hard. I, I just thought of another thing, by the way, another approach that you can do, uh, which other people can do, I, I'm not at this point yet, is what Rabbi Zimmer calls Midrash world, which is that leaning fully into Midrash and and showing them how Hazal had a shared framework. Actually, what I actually can quote this from Rabbi Zimmer himself. Um, hold on just one second here. Um, there you go. Um, so, uh, yeah, listen to any share from Rabbi Zimmer on this because uh, this is his, uh, his jam. Uh, Rabbi Zimmer once wrote, Midrash creates an interconnected web of stories about people and events that underlie the Chumash. Many Midrashim of Chazal were said within the context of a shared framework of derived facts. Some Midrashim are meant to be taken figuratively and others literally, but oftentimes they are only referencing the shared Midrashic world of Chazal and Rashi. And, um, and what Rabbi Zimmer does is he, he fully fleshes out that midrash world, and then teaches midrash through that. And uh, and if I had the ability to do that, that would be a path that would m- be much easier for students to tread because it would be taking the way that they relate to midrashim, and then furthering it to the point where it is led to maturity, as opposed to like drawing the sharp demarcation that I do. Um, I I still take my approach not only because I can't do his approach, but at this point, but also I, I think because I'm more attracted to Peshat than Midrash, then this approach suits me better. But that would be an ideal way to uh, to do that is like fully lean into Midrash, but then mature it at each level as they grow older. You know, they start with little Midrash says, and then they start getting ideas like Rabbi Aronson was saying, and then they, they get to this idea of like, oh, it's it's Midrash world, you know, and then they're ready for Rabbi Zimmer. Well, on that point, uh, could you argue that like in that in that model, Rabbi Zimmer suggesting is it, yeah. it's a smooth transition, but maybe part of the disillusionment is coming because you're being so strong of pushing them and saying maybe is, you know, yeah. A- so th- that that's possible, but um, I feel like it's not. Uh, <laughs> so th- this is something that I feel like parents are not aware of so much now. Uh, uh, I, at least I've gotten a sense they're going to find this out through the internet, you know. And the way that the the Ramos three groups, the people on the internet are in group two. They are militant atheists who mock things that Hazal say uh, and, uh, and, you know, and deride it and, and also equate halakha with, with Gemara and stuff like that. And, and yeah, maybe if we were in a more insular society, then, uh, then it would, you know, then Rabbi Zimmer's approach would be objectively better. But um, I find that, you know, there are, stu- if you talk to students from Shalhavit who went to seminary, you know, there are also people, or, you know, there are also people, like there are people who discover this stuff, like, in their twenties, you know, and like, and the first time they discover it is these very intelligent atheists online who are just shooting stuff down, you know? So I, I feel like that's another reason why I, I, uh, I err on this side. And I'd rather them have this, like the shock now where we can work together over the course of years and like, you know, and I can ease them in and they can have a new, new normal and stuff like that, rather than having them experience that rude awakening, like <laughs> in their, in their, in their bedroom on their laptop, when they're like trying to investigate like questions of their faith, you know? But yeah, you're right. Is that it might come from from the fact that I am, you know, giving this uh, this presentation in this way. And look, I mean, if they learn Mefarshim, like <laughs> they'll see it in the Mefarshim. I mean, like the the amount of times that the Rosh Bam or the Ibn Ezra or the Abraham Nel will say that's just a midrash. Like, how could these great people do that? I mean, you know, but that that's 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 what these shot oriented Mefarshim do, you know. And uh, yeah, there's a different question. Sure. Let's say. Um... Maybe one could question is like a kid. Like I know they're different ages, but yeah. like when a kid is in his earliest stages of the learning, Chumash, I don't know, yeah. years old, six years old, seven years old, you know, maybe this distinction 
a shot and Drash, I, uh, you know, Medrash might be a little beyond him. And maybe yeah. it would be appropriate to tell him a story where those lines aren't clear. And if you stick to only shot, maybe the story or the interest that he won't catch his interest in the same way. Right. Maybe from start off that way, but then maybe you don't have to wait till he's 13 years old to give him the right. break it to him, but slowly as his mind develops, let him in on the fact that there are, there are differences. Yeah, right. So that, that's definitely an approach that, that, uh, that I've heard that people take. And I've, I've heard people explicitly say, like when I've asked the question, why don't they focus more on the shot in, uh, in elementary school? I've heard educators say, because you can't make it interesting enough to get them involved. And my gut reaction is always, well, then you're not doing it the right way. <laughs> you know, like, like there, there, are, there are people who can make, you know, you, there are definitely people who can make the shot interesting, you know, uh, without needing to bring in like Vashi's tail and stuff, you know. Maybe not everyone can do that, and maybe the people who can't do that do need to bring in midrash, and then maybe you can introduce them to this distinction later on. Yeah, it's definitely a viable approach. Uh, I guess I'm focusing more on like uh, the systemic, uh, what can be done systemically, you know. And I think that this, this thing, I think the world would be better off if, if across the board, then students knew what was stated in the psukim and what was not, you know. Um, At every at every age, yeah, I, I I do think that that's the best uh, the best thing. And look, you can look, you can still read midrashim, you know, like even if you introduce the word midrash into a young kid's vocabulary, like we'll look at the and then we'll we'll read a midrash. Like even that can just create the space of having two, you know, two things. I used to have a thing that I wanted to do. Uh, I never actually did, did this of uh, of having a different you know hat when we're having when I teach of having a midrash hat and like a shot hat, you know, uh, just to get a visuals thing. But like with a little kid that you know then. Uh, you, know, you you can you can make that distinction. You know, I don't think in other words, I don't think you have to give up on midrash entirely. Just making the distinction from an early age, I think, would be useful. Okay, if there are no more questions, then I guess we'll call it a uh, quit for today. And kids could definitely handle the, the, the distinction at a young yeah. age. They can just they they understand there's a difference between what's in a pasuk and what's in midrash. And you can right. make that explicit. Right. Truthfully, you know, I and Rabbi Weiss, you can tell me because you work with uh, younger age than I do. I wonder if there is even a matter of pride on the part of a kid to like know, like I think kids, like I've seen this in high schoolers, that a, a, a kid who knows the shot of the story, and like like he's like yeah, that's the shot, like and that's a midrash. Like there's a certain pride in like mastering the shot, you know, that maybe could be harnessed, you know, for that. I don't know, it could be some kids are excited about that differentiation. Other yeah, kids yeah. just notice the differentiation. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it depends on the kid. Yeah, yep. As all crew matters of Chinuch do. Okay. Thank you for uh, for coming. And uh, if you have any questions uh, or want any of the uh, stuff I mentioned, like the rehearsed letters, just uh, email me, uh, rajeshnegos at uh, gmail.com, and I'll send you the, uh, the PDF. It's a really, really worthwhile rehearsed read. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.